Okay. Well, whenever I go to a party or go to a bar, and somebody comes to me with the question, what do you do? I give the same answer. I say, I'm an evolutionary biologist who studies bacteria. And typically, I get the same reply, which is a panicking phase. The person immediately starts thinking about horrible things, such as infections, antibiotic resistance, food poisoning, diarrhea, you name it. And even though these are not at all the reasons why I study bacteria, you can imagine that by this stage in the conversation, I kind of screwed up. So today, I would like to tell you the real reason why I study bacteria. And the short answer is fairly simple. I study bacteria because they're awesome. And they're awesome for two reasons. First, we have quite some things in common with bacteria. Like us, bacteria are confronted with a very complex world. And the only way to make a living in this world is by making very smart decisions and having creative solutions. Second, by studying how bacteria like, handle their complex world, we, it became apparent that bacteria can have a very new and compelling view on evolution, which requires rewriting our textbooks. So let me start by giving you some examples how bacteria deal with their world. Of course, the world in which bacteria live is quite different from ours. They cannot simply walk to the supermarket and grab some food. Now, they somehow have to manage to move, find food, and prevent starvation. So how do they do this? Well, the best way to find out is by simply looking to the cells through a microscope. So that's what we did. We went to the lab, took some cells from the freezer of the species Bacillus cellulis, which is a species I study, and placed them on a food surface which was filled with delicious ingredients. Then we took a microscope and started staring at the cells. Well, initially, not much was happening. This is what we saw. Cells were just laying around silently. They didn't move. They all looked kind of the same. So we thought, well, probably these cells are enjoying their food. But then we decided to go a step further. So we used some modern laboratory technology to label the cells with fluorescent proteins. And in this way, we can monitor their behavior. And then we figured out that we were completely wrong. In fact, these cells were not behaving the same at all. Despite having the same genetic material, we saw two cell types, the red and the green cells. The red cells were producing a very slippery substance, which was secreted into the environment and was covering the entire surface, making it very slippery. The green cells were doing quite the opposite. They produced a very sticky substance, and it didn't stick to the surface, but it sticked to the cells. So then when we looked to the green cells later in time, we saw something completely remarkable, something we never saw before. The green cells were forming these highly organized bundles. But why? Well, to find out, we decided to zoom out a little bit. And then we noticed that these green bundles were folding into loops. And these loops were gliding over the surface. So in this particular image, the colony is in the lower left side, and the loops are pushing out to the upper right corner. So the green cells are forming these bundles in order to move. And this way, they can get new food. And it's a very creative solution when you think about it, especially when you realize that individual bacteria cells cannot move over the surface. It's so only by working together, these cells manage to move. In fact, cells are not only working together, they're even dividing jobs. Without the red cells, the surface wouldn't be slippery enough for the green cells to glide. So this discovery really changed my image of bacterial cells. These are not simple organisms. These are, in fact, quite smart creatures. But how do they make this kind of decisions? How can a cell even decide to become green or red? Well, like us, bacterial cells are continuously monitoring their environment. They have all kinds of sensors on their membrane, which is the skin of the bacterial cell, that can respond to environmental cues. And these, these sensors are called sensory proteins, which function like the eyes and the ears of the bacterium. The information is subsequently passed on to the regulatory proteins, which act like switches. They're either active or not, just like the neurons in our brain. And in this way, information is being processed. It's almost as if each cell is harboring a minuscule and primitive brain that allows it to observe and respond to the environment. So what we see in case of colony growth is that in the beginning, none of the cells is either green or red. But then as cells start dividing, the environment changes, and cells respond to these changes by becoming green or red. Unfortunately, not all problems can be solved in this way. Not all problems can be solved by responding to the environment. Sometimes the environment is simply unpredictable. For example, imagine being a cell, and you're running out of food, and you don't know if new food will become available in the future. Well, to survive starvation, what you can do 
is you can form a spore. There he is. So a spore is the hibernation state of a cell. It can survive for years without getting food. But it's one important downside. Forming a spore requires an extreme amount of time and energy. So this results in a dilemma. You kind of have the optimistic or the pessimistic choice. The optimistic cell would say, well, we're running out of food, but don't worry, everything's going to be fine. But the pessimistic cell would say, we're running out of food, we're all going to die, so let's form a spore as quick as possible. Well, of course, neither of them is right or wrong, because they don't know the future. So how can cells solve this dilemma? Well, again, bacteria have a very creative solution. What they do is they gamble. And I want to illustrate this to you by showing a wonderful movie which is made by my colleague Tonia from the Molecular Genetics Lab in Groningen. So what she did is she took two bacterial cells and placed them on a food surface with a tiny amount of food, just sufficient for having a couple of cell divisions. But then cells face starvation. So they have to decide, do I want to form a spore or not? So let's start the movie. So enough food, cells are happy, they're dividing, 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 until suddenly starvation kicks in. And then you see some cells forming a green dot that turns white. These are the spores while other cells stay normal cells. It's pretty amazing. So even though all these cells have the same DNA and they're confronted with the same environment, they are taking different decisions. It's almost as if each cell is tossing a coin and gambling about its future. And of course, gambling is quite risky, because by gambling, the cell has a high chance of taking the wrong decision. But by having this variation inside the population, always a fraction of the cells took the right decision. So this variation assures that the group as a whole will do well, whatever happens in the future. Well, this can even be taken a step further. Cells can not only change their behavior, they can even change their DNA, and thereby affect evolution. So cells can take up DNA from the environment and integrate this DNA into themselves. And the bacteria cells I study do this when they get stressed out, when they run out of food. So these are the blue guys in this microscopy image. So DNA is a fairly stable molecule. So if organisms die in the environment, the DNA hangs around for a while. And what these cells can do, they can acquire the DNA to the membrane, break it apart, and take up one of the strands and integrate it into their own DNA. This is completely spectacular when you think about it. I mean, look to your neighbor and imagine that you can swap some DNA. You might get the eye color of your left neighbor and the dancing skills of your right neighbor. This is, in fact, what these bacterial cells are doing. They're changing their identity. But again, why? Why would these cells do that? Well, by taking up DNA from the environment, they create genetic variation, and thereby they start an evolutionary experiment. So we all know how evolution works from high school books. Evolution occurs when we have a group of individuals with different traits. Some traits are better than others, and these traits are selected simply because individuals with those traits survive better. As the famous quote of Herbert Spencer tells us, survival of the fittest. So the speed of evolution crucially depends on the amount of variation inside the group. When all individuals have the same trait, there's nothing to select for, and therefore no evolution. But when individuals have different traits, this will boost evolution. Well, bacterial cells are taking this to the next level. By taking up DNA from the environment, they actively generate genetic variation. And even though most of the genetic variants will fail, if only one of them succeeds, the group as a whole can survive. So again, what we see is that variation is good for the group. Well, modern technology shows us that bacteria have many, many more mechanisms by which they can edit and exchange DNA. Yet, interestingly, when we look to the premises of our evolutionary theory, we still largely base them on animals and plants, where we assume that DNA can only be transferred from the parent to the offspring. Well, these bacteria show differently, and that's why I think it's really time to rewrite our high school teaching books and to include the fascinating behaviors that we see in bacteria. In the end, the pedigree of life is not like a nice-looking tree, it's more like a messy and complex web in which every now and then, chunks of DNA get swept around. So the next time you go to a party and you see some people, please help me spread the word that bacteria are in fact awesome. They can work together, they can divide jobs, they can gamble, and they can even affect the way we look to evolution. Thank you.